All right, everyone, welcome to day four of module one. If you're watching this video, you have clicked into module one, you have found day four, and you've clicked on the checklist. So let's just run through that really fast. Today, you should read chapter two, sections 2.6, and chapter four, sections 4.1 and 4.5. 2.6 is all about time value of money techniques. That's what we'll run through in the first part of this lecture. 4.1 and 4.5 are all about savings, and that's what we'll talk about in the second part of this lecture. By the end of the today, you should be comfortable knowing the different types of low-risk savings options um, where you can place your money, relatively short-term stuff. Um, you'll complete a workshop where I'm going to give you $2,000, and I'll give you four different savings vessels to choose, and you'll tell me which one earns the highest effective rate of interest. You're going to go find these places, too. You're going to Google banks online or go to your own bank and figure out what interest rates you can get. Um, you're going to go to treasurydirect.gov uh, and pick out treasury bills and savings bonds. Should be a pretty good exercise. Um, don't forget to submit that in um, our assignments folder. Then you'll complete your homework on chapter four, um, the last homework of the week. Uh, you'll get your discussion board comment down with your group. And then the last thing that's unique is I've placed a sample study quest. Um, note, it's just a sample. If you just study the stuff on that quest, you might not do well on the quest tomorrow. But it's there to give you an idea of what a quest looks like. So be sure to look at that. Again, that's located in our day four folder right there. So you can click and see what that looks like. All right, let's get going. So part one, we're going to talk about interest rates and how to compute some future value and present value of different cash flows with interest rates. And then we're going to talk about um, the power of compounding interest and savings accounts, some types of checking accounts and types of savings accounts that you might use um, for some short-term savings. So I have a few questions to get us started with this lecture. The first of which is, how do banks earn money? So take a minute and think about it to yourself. What's your answer? How do banks earn money? Well, in short, they charge fees or interest. And interest is sort of the topic of the day. So one major way banks make money is by lending out for different purchases. So when you buy a home, you take out a mortgage, you're going to pay that back with interest. If you um, buy a car, you'll take out a loan and you'll pay the loan back with interest. So they make money based off of interest. But they have to get the money somewhere, right? Banks lend out money. How do banks get money? That's my next question. Think to yourself. How do banks get money to lend out? Well, we put it there. Uh, consumers and businesses use banks to hold our money. We put them in to the banks in various ways, either by checking accounts or longer term savings accounts. Um, but either way, they get our money and they're able to lend it out. They don't just leave it there in the vault. Um, they actually make use of it and they lend it back out for people to use to purchase more things. So how do they entice us to put our money into their bank, right? What is one reason you might choose to save in a bank versus keep it under your mat, keep money under your, under your mattress. Well, they pay us interest, right? Right now, it's not very much. So today is the 6th of June when I'm recording this and uh, in 2018, and you'll see the interest rates are not very hot right now across short-term um, savings vessels, but let's take a look at them nonetheless. Cash underneath your mattress, of course, is not gonna earn any interest. Checking account pays you 0.04%. Wow. Um, not much better for savings and money market accounts. These next three or four, if you don't if you don't know what these are, that's fine. We'll talk about them shortly. Certificate of deposits, treasury bills, and savings bonds, um, still quite low. But there's a few lessons to learn. First of all, banks try to get us to give their money by offering to pay us interest when we give it to them. Um, the longer we, so here's lesson number one, the longer we go without our money, the more they're willing to pay. And that's valuable, right? If a bank wants to learn out, loan out for a 30-year mortgage, 
they're going to need you to put your money into the bank and not need it for 30 years. That's a tall order. So in order to get you to do that, they're going to pay you super large interest on a long term um, savings account like that. Um, right here, the only example I have pulled down is a one year CD as opposed to your daily checking account. And you can see that the interest is higher because you're committed to leaving that money there longer. The other lesson to learn is that interest rates also depend on, so why do you think the rates are so low right now in this particular time? Economic fluctuations. So we had a big recession between um, around 2008, 2009. And in a recovery, the Federal Reserve likes to hold interest rates low. Now, if you want to know about the whole interplay between banks and the Federal Reserve, then um, take some economics, take money and banking. We'll definitely answer that question for you. But in the short, why is the Fed keeping rates low? Well, businesses borrow to fund projects. And when interest rates are low, they can afford to borrow. And that, that uh, kickstarts the economy. And then consumers, right? You borrow for high-end purchases like cars and houses. And um, when loans are cheap, you can afford to do so. And when you do so, you create jobs and economic activity, right? People work to produce those goods. So... Um, rates are, are quite low for a variety of reasons. There's just one of them. Um, it, and we kind of talked about this in chapter one. When the economy's down, interest rates are generally down. And when the economy heats up, the interest rates get kind of high. All right. So in terms of making financial calculations over interest, there's two different frameworks we work in. One is we're thinking about a single sum investment. And this is when you make one lump investment, one lump sum investment at some time period, and then you you cash it out some point in the future. So um, you put your money in a certificate of deposit, and then a year later you pay you take your money out. Right? That's a single sum investment. An annuity investment, you're going to set up an account that allows you to make level payments into the account. So let's suppose that you have a um, money market mutual fund savings account. That's just a, a savings account where the funds are invested in the uh, money market and you can get a usually a better rate that way. Um, and so you, you say, I'm going to save $100 a month into this account and then in two years, hopefully have enough money to make some sort of down payment. Um, that's an annuity, right? Single sum, you would just put some money in an account and then pull it out in two years. In an annuity, you're going to make level payments into this account and then do something with the money in like two years. And so there's two different types of calculations we're going to work with, present value and future value. And so future value asks the question, how much is a dollar worth, uh, is a dollar given to me today worth in the future if I invest it? And so an example here is like savings for retirement. If you put money away today, how much will it be worth when you retire? That's a future value problem because you're saying, I've got money today. I don't know what it's going to be worth in the future. Let's compute that future value. Present value is the opposite. You're going to look at how much a dollar you earn in the future is worth today. And students are usually like, well, that is useless. Like, why do I need to know something like that? Well, one way it comes in is when you think about buying and selling stocks, especially dividend paying stocks. Stocks probably have some general growth rate over time. And then you also get paid some level cash payment over time. And that money is valuable to you. And then somebody comes along and says, hey, I'll buy your stock from you. And they make you an offer. Well, how are you supposed to compare a lump sum amount that they're offering you today versus something that's paying you cash flows out over time? Well, you take the present value of those cash flows. Turns out the total value of all those funds added up when you include interest should be less than what the person's offering you in order for you to take the deal. So you can use it to compute stock prices. One thing that's going to throw a hitch in our calculations is compounding rules. So we're going to be solving for future value or present value. We're going to be given an interest rate, but then we're going to be told something about how frequently that interest is compounded. And what it means for interest to be compounded is how often is interest added back to your principal investment uh, so that it can earn more interest. So here's an example to clear up compounding. Suppose you have a $1,000 investment that earns 4% compounded annually. That means at the end of the year, you'll earn 
$40 of interest. Compounding interest means we're going to take that $40, add it to the $1,000 before we add the next 4% interest so that you're earning interest on interest. And so this time around, you earn $41.60, not just $40. If you didn't have compounding, if interest was just what we call simple interest, then that $1,000 earns $40 every year, every year, and you would earn less interest um, than if it were compounded. All right, so let's do some examples. With this problem, I want you to tell me a few things. I'm going to read it, and I want you to tell me whether it's a single sum or annuity problem, and whether we're solving for present value or future value, and what is the compounding rule. A lot of times in these problems, I like to write down the variables first um, and and then fill them in to see what's missing. And so we'll practice that later. Actually, let's not do that right now. But how much money do I have to save today to buy a $200,000 condominium in eight years if the interest rate is 5% annually? So pause the video and give it a try. What do you think? Answer these questions. This is a present value problem. How much money do I have to save today? So it's asking what is the present value of this future value? Eight years is the number of periods. The 5% interest rate is compounded annually. So we have a single sum present value problem in which the interest rate is compounded annually. Let's solve this problem. So here's where you're going to need your BA2 uh, plus calculator. If you don't have it yet, go and get it now. Um, go and pull it out now. I'm going to be teaching how to solve time value money problems using that calculator. So I like to draw timelines. I've been told there's eight years, so I go ahead and draw eight periods. I have to save today, well, I don't know the present value, to buy $200,000 condominium. That's the future value. If the interest rate is 5% annually, and I know my interest rate. So the way we use our calculator is we're going to push the value into the calculator and then press the variable that it corresponds to. So in this example, $200,000, I, I type in 200,000 and I press FV. Your calculator should say future value equals 200,000. Then I put five, that's the interest rate. I pressed interest. That's going to then say interest equals five. Eight is the number of periods, so I press eight and then I assign it to N. And then we are going to compute so this is the, how you solve. You press compute and then the variable you care about. If you've done this correctly, you should see negative 135, 367, and 87 cents on your calculator. Don't freak out with that negative number. In this calculator, negative numbers represent cash outflows from your pocket. Since this is an investment by you, this means you've taken $135,000 out of your pocket and put it in a bank. You've lost it. That's why it's negative. But when it comes back to you, it's positive. Okay. If this process of pushing the values and then pushing the variable is confusing, check out Appendix E. You'll see all the help you need for just working this calculator in Appendix E of your books. All right, try this one out on your own. Pause the video and see if you can do what we just did on your own. A strategy that I like to employ that helps students. I think this is the pen. I like to write out all of my keys on paper. Future value, present value, um, number of periods, interest rate, pardon the mess, I'm not used to writing with a mouse. And um, this, is not, this is not a problem that uses payment, but we could write that too. Okay, so zero for payment. Then you read your problem and you decide which variable is missing. So give it a pause and try this problem out. All right, so here's what you would do. How much money will I have in eight years if I invest $35,000 at a fixed rate? Well, okay, I'm told the present value in this one, 35,000. But remember, it's a cash outflow, so make it negative. I'm told the number of periods, eight. I'm told the interest rate, 3.5. I'm not told the present value, so this must be what I'm computing. I like to do this for every problem because it helps me organize what I'm solving for. 
Okay. All right. And if you do those things, you'll see you get $46,088.32. All right, now let's consider this problem. How much money do I have to save each year to buy $200,000 condominium in eight years if the interest rate is 5% annually? You tell me, is this a single sum or an annuity problem? You would be right if you said annuity. This is annuity because we're talking about saving each year, not just at the beginning of the year, but every time period. Um, and so we're going to solve in this problem for the payment. How much do I have to save each year? This problem doesn't give us a present value, so PV is zero. It tells us that I'm going to save every year some level amount and then hopefully get to $200,000. But the good thing about an annuity is that these little payments all along the way are at earning interest. And so we got to use time value of money. You can't just add up all the payments to 200,000. The incorrect answer is 200,000 divided by eight. So what would we put into our calculator? Write all your keys out, present value, future value, interest, number of payments, and payment. I don't have a present value. There's a 5% interest rate, 8%, eight periods, $200,000 is the future period, and now I'm computing payment. So I would press compute payment. You should get, remember it's a cash outflow, negative, uh, sorry, this should say payment. Payment. Um, $20,944.36 annually needs to be saved um, in order for us to get to $200,000. If you just did $200,000 divided by eight, that would say $25,000 a year. That's awesome. Because of interest, you get to save less per year to pay for your condo. If you didn't get that answer, there could be a few reasons. Your calculator might not be set in end mode. Notice I computed these payments at the end of every period. Your, computer might be, your calculator might be set to begin to where it's considering you saving at the beginning of each period. I'm going to work in end mode in this class. So your appendix will tell you how to do this, but just in case, click the second key on your calculator and click payment. If your screen reads end, you don't have to do anything. You press second and the compute key, that will get you out of the, the um, settings. If your screen reads BGN, then you're set to begin. I want you to press second and the enter key. That's gonna change um, your screen to read end and then press second and quit and you'll be on the right page. All right, try this one on your own. No help. See if you can do it. Pause the pause the video. Okay, now here's the help. We plugged in our variables, just like on the last screen. Um, we're we're solving for the exact same thing, the payment, and so you should have gotten two thousand seven hundred thirty dollars and ninety four cents. Again, negative, just because it's a cash outflow. And dang it, I've done it again. PMT. All right, we haven't messed with the compounding rules so far. So far, everything has been an annual compounding rule. But compounding frequency matters. Interest rates are going to be quoted to you as annual interest rates. So you all are probably familiar with the term APR, annual percentage rate. That is the interest that is quoted to you when you take out, say, an auto loan or a credit card. But it's going to be compounded more frequently than that usually monthly. So let's consider you're going to make a thousand dollar investment. It's a single sum investment for five years. One account pays you 5% annually. The other one pays 5%, but they're going to compound it monthly. Which would you choose? What do you think? What would you choose? If some of you are going, I have no idea. That's okay. That's why you're taking this course. So let's check it out. You can do the future value of option A. We've done this a million times. Well, technically four in the last four slides, but you should get $1,276.28. With option B, you have to do some extra work. You got to con convert the rate to a monthly rate because it's compounded monthly. And the way we do this is as follows. 
$1,000 investment. This is not an annuity. So we set the zero, um, set payment to zero, zero payment. That 5% interest is an annual rate, but it's compounded monthly. So we'll divide by the number of months in a year, five divided by 12. However, now the number of compounding periods doesn't agree. It's not five, five is years. There are 12 months in a year, so there are technically 60 periods. Every time you do a time value of money calculation and you have to change the compounding rule, make sure that your interest rate period, in this case monthly, matches the number of periods. So this needs to be months if your interest rate is monthly. It needs to be quarters if your interest rate is quarterly. Bonds are semi-annual. So this will be in half number of half years, and then this will be divided by two, right? Okay. And so if you do those things, you'll get $1,283.36. This is the larger sum. So... What, you, what actually matters on two different savings vessels, vessels that have different compounding rules is the effective rate of interest. The effective rate of interest is the way you're going to compare um, the amount, you can earn, amount of interest you can earn across different financial instruments. It's simply going to be the interest you earn divided by your initial investment. So for option A, this is just the $276.28 of interest divided by the $1,000 investment, so 2.76%. For option B, this is $283.36 divided by 1,000, so the ERI is a little larger for option B. The rule or the, the point of the story is the more frequent a rate is compounded, the higher the effective rate of interest. So if you're saving, you want high compounding, you get higher interest earn. If you're borrowing, what do you think? You want low compounding because the less the interest is compounded, the less interest you'll get charged. So that's the end of the time value of money portion of this lecture, uh, chapter two, section 2.6. If you want additional practice, question five in the back of chapter two in your text has uh, five questions, pardon, four four questions, and here are the solutions. See if you can get the solutions. Okay, so now that you know, now that you're an expert in computing interest earned, um, it's time to think about ways to save your money. We've all heard about checking and savings accounts, but let's think more, uh, a little more deeply about them. Checking accounts are, are also called demand deposit accounts. And what, the reason why they're called demand deposits is because if you have sufficient funds in your account, the bank has to pay you out of them with no penalty and no delay. When you put money in your checking account, it's basically on demand. Think about how often you use your debit card. Savings accounts are called time deposits because it's usually put in there with the expectation that you're not going to touch it for a period of time. But banks often entice us to keep our money in time deposits a little longer by providing us some interest. So checking accounts often are like zero. And even right now, savings accounts will pay a little bit more, but it's only like a 0.01 or 0.02%. The other thing banks try to do in savings accounts to keep a, our money in there, um, because remember, they're trying to lend it out, is they'll put penalties in place if we withdraw too many times or go below a minimum threshold. Usually those savings accounts that have those um, penalties, however, offer the most the highest interest rates. However, let's say you want to go beyond your traditional checking and savings account and you really want to start trying to earn some interest and do some short-term savings. Next place you might look is a certificate of deposit or a CD. CDs are offered by banks. You can find them if you walk into your brick and mortar bank or if you Google them online. They are always set up for fixed periods of savings. So you'll see one-year CDs, three-year CDs, five-year CDs, um, and the idea is, if you can't, if you don't touch that money, if you touch that money before the the term is up, you pay a penalty, um, and the penalty just depends on the bank that you're working with. Um, the good thing about CDs is because you're you're using them at a bank, they are uh, federally insured. 
banks often don't fail. Um, but if your bank was to ever close, you would not lose your money in your CD because it's federally insured. Um, and the interest rate you're going to get on these is fixed. Um, so you don't have to worry about economic fluctuations. Like if there's an economic downturn, you don't get a return on your investment. CDs are very safe investments. You can find these, um, as I said, at commercial banks and online banks. And in fact, in your workshop, you're going to be doing just that. The bank, uh, your bank is not the only place you, you can go to save money. You can also save through the federal government. Um, and you can also save through your local government as well. But we're going to talk only about federal government savings vehicles. The first one is going to be the U.S. Treasury bill. U.S. Treasury bills are debt securities by the, issued by the United States Treasury. The reason why they are savings to you is because you will buy a bill and you'll get a piece of paper, essentially. It's electronic now. but And your money will go to the government, much like it's going into a bank. And then at some specified period in the future, you'll get your money back plus some interest. So it's just like savings. Treasury bills are short-term savings vehicles. Um, they are issued for terms that are below a year. So a, a U.S. Treasury bill can be a 52-week bill, uh, bill all the way down to a four-week bill. So you can actually save something for four weeks and get a tiny bit of interest back, but it's not much. Um so let's use what we know already. Um, we have 52 weeks versus four weeks. Which type of treasury bill do you think is going to offer a better interest payment? Which one is going to offer the better interest payment, the longer term or the shorter term? It's going to be the longer term, right? If the government is going to ask you to give up your money for a year, they're going to have to compensate you more for it than if they were asking you just to give it up for four weeks. You can buy these at treasurydirect.gov. There's an auction, uh, auction lists every Monday. The auction goes live on Tuesdays and you can buy these treasuries for four weeks, 13 weeks and 26 weeks on those Mondays. The 52 week bills are only every four Mondays. One other advantage is that treasury bills have no state or local income tax. Different levels of government, and when I say that, I mean your local Milledgeville, city of Milledgeville, Baldwin County governments, um, your state of Georgia government, and your federal government don't believe in taxing one another. So if you earn income on a federal instrument, you don't have to pay state and local tax. You will have to pay federal income tax. The other interesting things about, thing about um, treasury bills is they're sold at a discount. So you won't see a quoted interest rate on um, a newly issued treasury bill. You will see them quoted at what's called a discount. And so here's what that means. You might see the price of a T-bill at $98. By the way, they're sold in $100 minimums. Then you would see what's called the par value or the face value of $100. What this means is you buy the bond, the bill, pardon, at 98 bucks in one year or however the duration is, you get paid 100. So you earn two bucks of interest on the $100 spent. It's like loaning the government 98 bucks and they pay you 100 back when, they, when, it's at, when the loan's at maturity. So what do you think? Let's say you bought $980 worth of treasury bills. What would be your effective rate of interest? Can you remember when we computed that? Well, if you bought $980 worth of T-bills, you bought 10 $98 T-bills. So when those come due, they're going to be paid back 100 each, so you're going to make 1000 So $20 interest earned over $980 investment is 2.04%. I want to take you back and show you the web page. So here's Treasury Direct. You'll go here during your workshop. Here are the, the bonds that most recently sold. Um, ignore these percentages here. We will learn about um, the interest, the investment interest when you trade bonds. 
for now we're gonna we're just talking about new issued bonds. So let's look at this 26 week T bill very recently um, issued on the seventh, um, or sorry, um, it will become live on the seventh, um, and it will mature on a December sixth. You can buy this for ninety eight dollars and ninety five cents, and so when uh, twenty six weeks is up. You'll get paid 100 bucks and you'll make about a dollar, right? Not that much interest earned at this point. If we go back and look instead at the four week, you'll notice it's priced at $99.86. So, shorter term, worse interest. You're only going to make about 14 cents on this. Um, Treasury bill. All right. Series EE bonds are longer term savings vehicles than US Treasury bills. So, of course, there's bonds that are in between one year and what this Series EE bonds are going to be. Um, but this is a survey course. We're not going to get too specific. Um, Series EE bonds earn interest. They're going to earn interest for 30 years. You have a fixed rate of interest for 20, and then the Treasury can change the rate in the final 10 years. These um, are a little peculiar. So they're, they're safe, and they're guaranteed to double in 20 years. So if you bought a $5,000 Series EE bond, then it would be $10,000 guaranteed in 20 years, even if your rate was too low. You just have to hold it for that long, and the government will pay the difference. Now, prior to, I think, 2005, these were only sold in paper form. And when they were sold in paper form, you purchased these at 50% of par value. So your bond would say, for example, $10,000 on it, but you would pay $5,000. Guaranteed to double in 20 years, that $5,000 would turn into $10,000. Now all of these are electronic, and your book doesn't talk about the electronic Series EE bonds yet. It just talks about paper bonds. Now it's all electronic, and you pay face value. So a $5,000 bond is going to cost $5,000, and it's just going to have a quoted interest rate and earn interest, and if it doesn't double in 20 years, the government will pay you double. It's identical. I don't know why they made the change in the way they quote these things, um, but it's just different. But just know that your book might ask you in your questions what the price of a, say, $10,000 um, Series EE bond is, and they're talking about the paper versions, and so that would be $5,000. Um, there are requirements that you hold on to these bonds for a while. So you can't cash them in before a year. If you do under five years, you pay the last three months interest penalty. Um, and then you can cash them in after that, but you're not going to get double, right? That's the, the kicker. If you wait 20 years, you'll get all the way up to double, regardless of what the interest is. The, they are um, taxable um, by the federal government. Um, like T-bills, the state and local Income taxes do not apply, but federal income taxes do. Unless you redeem these for educational purposes and you demonstrate, for example, you pay for college tuition with them, um, then you will not pay income tax on the interest earned. All right. Um, that is all I have for you in this lecture. Uh, don't forget to complete your checklist for this module as well as all other modules. Get all of your homework, all of your workshops out of the way. And then you can begin to, to work on Friday. And the only thing you have for Friday, if you do all those things, is to study for your quest. Um, so good luck.